have another. Right, thank you. Welcome everyone to FTG Day 3. Um, we're going to have a, another research heavy day with uh, three sessions. We're also going to have the game education track uh, happening uh, later in the afternoon, at least where we are. Uh, we also have uh, a keynote by Luke Dicken uh, right in the middle of the day. And don't forget, there's going to be a demo and competition session right at the end of the conference. You should have also received um, your voting ballot. So uh, don't forget to vote before the end of the conference tomorrow, before the closing session. And um, I'll let Stefano take it away with the uh, Games Beyond Entertainment track. Thank you, Lonis, and thank you everybody for being here. We still have only 12 participants, but I trust they will uh, trickle in as um, the few initial minutes are passing. So we have uh, four talks for today, two full papers and two short papers. And I'm going to start by announcing uh, the first one, which is not going to be a video. It's going to be a live presentation, meaning that if you're taking too long, I will start to interject and stop you. Like we need to have a full hour, so try to be timely as much as you can. So the first talk is a full talk called Misusing Mobile Phones to Break the Ice. It's a very interesting paper about like starting conversation and relationship with, with strangers and using a mobile phone for that. Um, the authors are eight authors, which is the tie for the most authors um, for uh, this year's papers. And they revolve around Delft University, if I'm not mistaken. I see that two of the authors are here, Albert and Rafa. I suppose that Albert will be the one doing the talking. That's Thank right. You. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, you can please take it away. It's yeah, sure, let me just select the proper screen for sharing. Sure. That's right. All right, are you able to see my, uh, my presentation? Yeah, looks good. Yeah. All right, hello FG20, my name is Albert and I am here uh, representing uh, Team Icebreakers from TU Delft. And I'm here representing my teammates as well as our professors. Let's get into it with a uh, nice long animation. Firstly, let's start by talking about the motivation for our game design, which is uh, threefold. Firstly, you've all played tabletop games before, card games, board games. They all are very interactive and you talk a lot and you have to interact uh, to solve the problem or communicate. And so uh, that was a basis for to create a tabletop game. Also, when you're with new people, you probably need a catalyst, something to bring everyone together to boost this brainstorming. And lastly, one thing that is very distracting, especially if you feel a bit awkward, smartphones can be a, a great escape, uh, but also a bad way if you want to uh, uh, actually promote interaction between uh, players. So we were set out to solve ice breaking, which is, uh, we, couldn't, we uh, came to four points to promote cooperation, as in you, you cooperate to solve a common goal, not individuality in this case. The psychological safety of the players, that you feel safe to share your ideas with each other. The, <clears throat> the familiarity between team members, you, feel, you, you get to feel comfortable with your uh, uh, players, with, where everyone is a fellow player, not an uh, enemy in the game as well as uh, the two very disjoint personalities, dominant versus shy, as well as how they interact with the game and to make sure that they are all at a level playing field. Yeah, so let's get to the actual game. So uh, in the picture here, you can see the game rendered across three separate screens while it is one instance of the game. This is a cooperative mix game, that is you you play together, you play the same game and you help each other to find the goal, which in, you can see in the center phone is the blue plus. And to promote uh, that it's safe and you have time to think, it is a turn-based game without a time limit. And uh, for to make it a dynamic game, it, it supports a changeable maze layout. That is, it, you can change the maze around either to help a player get closer to a goal or to a power-up or make the uh, just a uh, faster traversal of the maze, and this works across the screens. So, the most important part, cooperation. You can, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can shift the walls around uh, to, to change the entire dynamic of the maze. 
and power-ups that you're all familiar with. In this case, we have the ones that can increase your movement speed or you can walk through the walls. These are the power-ups we implemented, as well as positive experience. There are always a focus on a positive experience playing the game. There's never, you can't poison some player to make them slower. You can only boost other players. So you can always help each other. There's no way to, it's not more Kart. Uh, so psychological safety of the players is a very important factor, both that we considered and that was part of the project. And uh, there are no negative consequences whatsoever. It cannot, it cannot get worse. And uh, to ensure that every phone is important and every player is important, there's a fog of war, which if you're not familiar with, shadows the screen until you exploit it. Uh, so you actually have to go through every phone. Not one player can't just find the finish line and tell everyone to do what to do. That's also a critical part. And this is a new kind of game. Tabletop digital games is a new thing we were tasked to do. So what challenges did we find? Firstly, networking. You might imagine that phones in close proximity would be great for something like Bluetooth for any, any kind of close level protocol, but that's not good because you have many phones connecting and connecting them with Bluetooth would be a big mess. So it's just a regular room-based uh, uh, game where you connect over internet, Wi-Fi or 4G. And another part that's also very important when it comes to tabletop digital games is that you have multiple phones and they are, they are placed in a certain position how do you actually attach them and send that logic to the game? As well as if you have a, a fancy animation, like a ball rolling across the screens, if you have hundreds of milliseconds of delay, that's not gonna look good at all. And disparate screen DPIs, such a one object that might look a certain size on one screen might look completely different on another screen. So that also has to be taken into consideration. And uh, in the terms of players, some people might not want to use their phone, so you have to support players without phones, as well as prevent dominant players that I mentioned earlier. All right, I have a small demo prepared. So these are supposed to be two separate phones in this case. So you start by uh, aligning the phones how you want them to be geometric or, or geometrically. And then in this case, you connect the maze by doorways where you can walk seamlessly across the screen. So here, uh, it's, a, it's a simple game where you walk on a turn-based movement and uh, collect these power-ups that are rotating across the screen. Uh, and you can, you, you move in turns, pretty simple. And in this case, we showcase just how you move across the screen. While you're here, in this case, you could, we teleported, but you can also just perform the move animation across the screens. And giving power to other people allows them to use, you, uh, use what you are able to, to promote them uh, getting closer to goal in case you are very close and they are far away, for example. Uh, and uh, most importantly, you can also uh, change how the maze looks, uh, here in this case, to move the walls around uh, and walk through walls. Those were the kind of features we implemented in the game other than the, the core dynamics of just getting to the finish line. That's a very short demo. Oh, and they finished again because both or every player has to reach the finish line, finish line before you finish uh, the game. It's a cooperative game after all. all right. We actually did some uh, people play this game uh, and have never played it before. And it was very intuitive, even though it's a new kind of game, a tabletop digital game. It was very intuitive. Uh, it was just you, moving across the screen felt natural, and it was also pretty fun. The game was very simple, but it was very fun because you've never done this before, bringing phones together, trying to solve this maze. And the question that we were asked, does it break the ice? And they actually said that Maze Maestro helps to create a bond between the players, which was a good testimonial. Uh, and uh, conclusively, I'd like to talk about the game and also what it might bring. So Maze Maestro is a very good method for helping to break the ice. Uh, but naturally, we did, we did it on a low, small scale in school. Uh, so mining thorough field validation. And uh, also for the game itself, you could implement uh, mini games 
inside the game to actually enable power-ups. And something is also very popular today uh, is silly characters to promote. It's a bit of light fun. It was very popular today in almost every single game where you have cosmetics and the like. But also what's very exciting is what tabletop digital games can bring as a category. So not just maze maestros, but combining phones to create a virtual board, uh, just like a tabletop game, but arbitrary phones and devices, which, I mean, everyone brings a phone to a party or a conference or anything, so it's always available. That's everything I have to say. Thank you for your time, and I hope you're as ex excited as me for what this category of uh, games and Minds Master can bring for the future. Feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Albert. Um, let me see if there's anybody in among the participants who raised the hand or... Well, nobody said anything in chat. So, uh, oh, well, we have one. Tim, you can unmute yourself and uh, just ask your question. Cool. So I was wondering, there have been a number of games that have built, that have been used to kind of build a bond um, from players that haven't met each other. How do you think these kinds of games would translate to repairing a bond between coworkers? Which kind of games did you mention? I couldn't hear you properly. Oh, so like um, Maze Maestro, I think in the paper you had Grapple Knots as well. Uh, how they could uh, create a bond in like a conference or something? You mean? No, no, how they could repair a bond. Oh, well, I mean, you mean uh, if there's multiple people, uh, they might have, there might be a conflict. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the game is just a, a tool now to promote ice breaking. So the element uh, that we use to combine phones, it's supposed to be a fun and lightweight environment. And as you mentioned, one positive thing is that if there's a bond that needs to be repaired, most likely you, you want to kind of make it worse for the other player in that case, since you, you might have a conflict with each other. But here in the game that is my spine, there are no ways you can actually make it worse. You can only make it better. So although we haven't tried it between people who have a, a feud or anything, I could imagine that the lack of abilities like a game like Mario Kart, Mario Kart, there's no way to actually make it worse, might be a benefit for uh, actually helping repair bonds, although we haven't tried it. Thank you, Albert. I have a question myself, if you don't mind, very briefly. Um, you decided to identify the positive pickups uh, with this sort of abstract universal symbol, which is money, right? Like it's currency. Um, it, have you given any thought to the ideological message you're sending? So like it's oh. difficult to collect as much money as possible, as in they could have been abstract shapes or like just positive orbs of light, but you decided to use money. Can you comment on that choice? It was, uh, we, uh, we didn't have a creative artist designing the game and these logos were available uh, at the top of the Unity store kind of. So we just wanted to get something that actually moves, something that you can interact with, but the icons should not necessarily represent money. Right, so maybe you can consider that for the new version of the game that you, you're sending quite a strong message here, like we're together in this task of collecting money. Anyway. Um, I'm probably like sabotaging you right now instead of giving you an advice. So it sounds like if I if I can jump just please jump please. in, Stefano. That sounds like a great uh, uh, a great suggestion. I I agree with you, and uh, and I think it would be of course this is a prototype which has been tested. It is it needs to be tested uh, thoroughly. Um, I I fully agree that the, the the main message here was to to have a team who don't yet to know each other to collaborate. So in fact, when they are collecting uh, those power-ups, uh, in our experiments, most of the time it was not for use themselves, but to, to gift a, a power-up to a teammate because they need it more in their turn. And uh, so that was the, the message we wanted was to share um, something valuable that is helpful in, in the end. The whole team wants to get uh, together at the end. So, but that's a good, uh, very good comment, and I'm very grateful to Tim as well for um, suggesting a totally new project, which is uh, a game for uh, repairing, uh, <laughs> repairing conflicts and relations, uh, which is a totally uh, new branch of sport. Thanks so much. 
Beautiful. Thank you, Rafa, and thank you, Albert, both from uh, TU Delft. Uh, we need to move on to the second talk of this session, which uh, is another full paper. Uh, it's 15 minutes long, and it's uh, titled Learning Binary Search Trees Through Serious Game Based on Analogies. In this case, we only have two authors, what a small cohort, and they hail for, uh, from uh, Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, Alberto, you are up next. Take the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to play a video for, uh, for my presentation. So one second. Oh, here. Remember to share it with sound. Eh? Yeah, yeah, sure. Good afternoon. My name is Alberto Rojas. I'm a PhD student at Trinity College Dublin. My research topic focuses on the study of digital games for learning in higher education environments. In this talk, I'm going to present the theoretical foundations used to design a video game named DS Hacker, a game that teaches binary search tree data structure. Specifically, I'm going to explain the learning theory and learning principles used to design the game and how the game elements apply the learning theories to communicate the contents. Many researchers have used video games to improve the learning process of data structures. For example, we find few games that focuses on the stack data structure, such as the Star Chef, the Stack Em Up, and the Stack Game. We also find some uh, games that focuses on the linked list, such as the Space Traveler and La Petite Fit Cosmo. And also we find some games that uh, focuses on the AVL tree, such as a variation of Super Mario and a mobile game named the AVL tree game. From our review, we found three aspects that were not reported in most of the reviewed works. First, none of the reviewed works focuses on binary search trees. Second, most of the papers did not report the learning theory used to design the game, and when they did it, they did not explain how the game applies those principles. And third, all the reviewed works do not report the learning objectives. The aim of our project is to fill this gap. In other words, we intend to build a game that focuses on binary search trees, provide theoretical foundation to the learning aspects of the game, explain how the game applies the selected learning theories, and detail the learning objectives of the game. Now, I'm going to explain the learning theories used to design DS Hacker. First, the game was designed based on the constructivism paradigm. Constructivism suggests that learning is an active process where the learner builds new knowledge by relating familiar knowledge and new information. As we know, there are many constructivism theories. For our design, we use called experiential learning theory. This theory suggests that experiences play a major role in every learning process. Also, this theory suggests that learning is a relearning activity, it is a holistic activity, and that the environment plays a fundamental role. According to this theory, learning occurs as a cyclical process where learners transform their experiences into knowledge. According to Cole, this cycle works like this. First, the learner experiences a concrete experience. Then, the learner observes and reflects about this experience. Then, the learner integrates his or her reflections with previous knowledge and beliefs and translates those reflections into abstract concepts or theories. Finally, these abstract concepts can be used or tested in new applications that at the same time will generate a new experience. According to some authors like James Key, learning through video games follows a similar pattern. The second pedagogical approach that we used to design our game was the analogy. Analogies are comparisons between structures of different domains. Those structures most share symmetrical relations among some of their components. In educational environments, analogies are used to create relations between non-intuitive 
concepts and familiar concepts. The final pedagogical approach that we use is a modification of the constructive alignment framework. The constructive alignment framework suggests that a good pedagogical design ensures consistency among the learning objectives, learning activities, and assessment. Also, the objectives, activities, and assessment must be aligned with a learning theory. Now, I'm going to explain DS Hacker. DS Hacker is a PC game developed with Unity 3D that aims to teach binary search tree data structures to college students. The game is a third-person 3D action adventure and its aesthetics are sci-fi style. The story of the game takes place in a distant future where a corrupt corporation is harming the balance of society. In the game, the player controls a robot hacker who most reveals the intentions of this corrupt corporation. To do this, the player most traverse, traverse several labyrinths and extract information stored in certain areas of the labyrinth. So, why did we adopt the action adventure genre? As we know, the action adventure genre combines features from the adventure genre, such as the story driving and the conceptual puzzles, and action genre, such as the physical challenges. These elements have the potential to be used to teach conceptual and procedural knowledge. For example, it is possible to embed conceptual and factual knowledge in the game story. Also, it is possible to teach and practice procedures through the physical challenges. Additionally, the action adventure genre is quite popular among teenagers and young adults. That is our target population. Also, this increases the possibility that potential users are familiar to the genre and its game mechanics. Concerning the game design, the game environment reflects the structure and components of a binary search tree. In the game, each level possesses a labyrinth, and each labyrinth is made of chambers. Labyrinth represents the binary search tree, and the labyrinth's chambers represent the binary search tree nodes. Also, the chambers are arranged following the binary search tree principle, and each chamber has two portals that can be used to reach other chambers. Those portals represent the links of the binary search tree nodes. Additionally, each chamber has its own ID that represents the comparable key of the binary search tree node and a computer that stores information representing the associated values of the binary search tree node. The game story is used to teach the conceptual and factual knowledge. This is accomplished by an NPC called Anonymous, who introduces the missions and the binary search tree concepts at the beginning of each level. To facilitate the understanding of the binary search tree concepts, Anonymous take advantage of analogies between the game environment and the binary search tree elements. Currently, DS Hacker has five levels, and each level focuses on a set of learning objectives. A detailed list of the learning objectives can be found in the article. Level 1 and 2 cover topics related to the basic structure of the binary search tree, its properties, and the structure of its nodes. Level 3, 4, and 5 cover topics related to the GET algorithm such as the sequence of these algorithm steps and its outcomes. Also, each level has a mission, and each mission possesses one or more challenges. Missions embody the learning activities that the player should perform in order to achieve the learning objectives. So, as we can see, we designed a game environment that shares a symmetrical relation 
with the structure of the binary search tree data structure. This relation is presented to the player using the narrative elements of the game and analogies. Additionally, the missions provide tasks that allows the player to practice and test the new learned information. Also, these missions will ensure the achievement of the learning objectives. Also, we evaluated the first version of DS Hacker and we found that the first version was very difficult to play. To overcome this issue, we developed a second version of the game where we decrease its difficulty. Results of the evaluation of the second version of DS Hacker were very positive, and participants who played the game obtained better scores than participants who watched a video tutorial. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any question, I will be happy to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. Let's see if anybody among the participants have questions for you. Doesn't look like for now. Let's uh, take a... Oh yeah, we have Antonis. Uh, you can unmute yourself and just speak. Hi, um, hi Alberto. This was um, an interesting uh, project. I like that you have a fairly final um, look to your uh, to your prototype, and it's really exciting. I was wondering, uh, I guess, what makes it an action adventure? And we don't want to get into definitions, but where's the challenge? Because you mentioned there's a lot of physical challenges, etc. Uh, but the BSP, which is like the challenge of learning, is not a physical one, is it? Uh, no, no, it's not physical. It's a conceptual uh, uh, puzzle. Mm -hmm. So uh, the challenges is like. The physical challenge is to traverse the labyrinth, but in this case, there are not like a lot of physical challenges. We are uh, thinking to add them uh, later in in, a, in another uh, iteration of the of the game. Um, could you sorry like like what? what? Do you have an example? Of oh, uh, uh, for example, uh, I'm 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 planning to transform that in, uh, to add the shooting mechanics to it. So we are going to add like a, a enemies that, a, but with certain relation to the um, to the binary search tree nodes. For example, if if the the number of enemies should be like a, similar to the a, a keys of, of the room or something like that. This but okay. in this moment, it doesn't have like to to. to uh, okay, Antonis, I want to take another question before we move on to the third uh, talk. And there's a, a request from Amy Baskin in the chat, which uh, who asks, are off-topic or random elements also part of design? I ask to further um, clarify this question, and she asks, um, are they part of the learning process? Are there non-direct learning components or parts of the game that are just for fun? Are there non-direct learning components or, or just for fun? I, I don't get the, 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 the question. What, I also what think is... it's a bit of a uh, kind of a vague question. And Amy, would you mind coming and maybe asking it live, as in unmuting yourself and asking clearly what you mean? I mean, these lines are a bit difficult to understand also for myself. Yeah. yeah. As part of the learning process, or just not direct. Probably she means are there elements of the game that are not directly made for learning, but they just complement it. But I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of, of elements that are not uh, just uh, for learning. For example, it has like a like the music, like traversing the the uh, the labyrinth. You can explore like certain rooms that are not exactly part of the of the binary search tree node, but it will add like certain interesting features. Uh, also, I, I don't know, like, uh, also the, we found that, that there are certain elements that we thought that we are, they were not going to be so useful that actually students used a lot to remember uh, uh, when they are answering the tests. Uh, they use those elements to, to, to remember the, the, the concepts that they learned 
like right. the UI, for example, they, they use a lot like the UI, like the maps and the uncertain uh, comments to answer the, the test that we gave them. Right, and there might also be elements of the fiction of the game that do not necessarily teach anything but help immersion and guide the player. So that yeah, exactly. Also obviously, like there are many elements of the game that only serve as a, let's say, unifying and uh, smoothening factor in the experience. Uh, yeah, exactly. that, uh, Thank you very much for your uh, for your answers, and uh, Tony and Amy, thank you for your questions. Since you have time to write in chat, don't be afraid of asking long, very specific questions. Otherwise, we need to unpack them live. Um, we move, we now move on to the uh, thank you very much. third. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alberto. To the third uh, talk of today, which uh, in a way connects us to our hosts, which is also where I'm sitting right now, the University of Malta. In fact, the next talk is a collaboration between the Virtual University of Senegal, the Sorbonne University, and the, and the University of Malta. Um, the title of this short paper is Duty, a Mixed Initiative Handwriting Game for Preschoolers. I'm supposing that Antonis is going to be the speaker for this one? A video will be the speaker, but I'm here for questions. Okay, please uh, take the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your interest. My name is Jean-Michel Amatsar and I'm going to present Jehuti. This is joint work with Georges Yanakakis, Antonius Liapis, Alassane and Christophe Cambier. So it all starts with this map. We can see in a lighter blue countries in which more than 95% of children have access to preschool. Those are the United Kingdom, Spain, Germany, France, Italy, Australia, or Brazil. In the opposite, countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, India, Pakistan, and most sub-Saharan African countries are in a strong blue. And so those are countries in which less than 25% of children have access to preschool. So this work is in line with the fourth sustainable and development goal that is to provide a quality education for all. So to tackle this challenge we present Jehoti that, that is a mixed initiative, mixed initiative mobile game and the goal here is to teach handwriting with an artificial intelligence or AI component that, genera that generates handwriting style. It also adapts to the user style with a mixed initiative component that we are going to, to look in the, in the few slides ahead. So we can see in the short video how the game looks. We can select from a few letters and then ask for the AI to generate a letter in green. Then we can draw in white. And finally, ask for an evaluation. And so the evaluation is given in stars. And so the goal of the game is to get as many stars as possible. It it uses uh, an artificial intelligence model that have been produced by, that have been uh, published uh, by David Ha in 2017. It is a variational autoencoder, but a sequence to sequence variational autoencoder. And so the kind of inputs it uses is, for instance, the E that we can see here. The E is a sequence of points. And so those are going to be encoded in a recurrent neural network and encoded in a probability distribution as the latent space, meaning that for each latent vector, so each sequence gets a latent vector, and this latent vector is a probability distribution. We can sample from it. And for each sample, we can we can decode the, the latent, the latent uh, representation in an autoregressive fashion. It means that the decoder will first 
get predict the first point and then use this first point to feed itself and predict the second point and so on until it generates the full sequence and so this architecture is very modular we can use the encoder the decoder as standalone neural net or the VAE as a complete model so now let's talk about the mixed initiative component in the first screenshot that we can see at the bottom we have at first a user uh, an AI generated letter in green from this point we have tried to replicate it in white and ask for an evaluation if we look if we look at the diagram on the top we can see that the evaluation is the place in which uh, the mixed initiative component take place so if it's less or equal to three and a half stars it will be labeled as not good enough and then a new AI generated letter will be made this is the case from the first screenshot to the second screenshot we can see that the, in the second screenshot the AI generated letter in green is completely different either from the previous user generated user uh, drawing and the previous AI generated letter uh, let's focus back on the diagram now if it's more than four stars so more than three and a half stars uh, it will be labeled as good and if we focus back on the second screenshot uh, so we have more than four stars and so in this case the next screen will feature uh, an AI generated letter that's, that is based on the previous user input as you can see following the, the green arrow and the goal here is to build user-refined sample, user-refined generation. And the, so the, the goal is to lead progressively the user toward the correct way of writing a given letter, but while keeping his own style. And we, we think, we hope that this approach will lead to better better learning outcome so ITS are not new in the diagram that we can the graph on the right we have in we have conventional teaching that means one teacher and 30 children and we, we so this graph is from Wolf uh, that uh, she so she has written a brilliant book on, on this topic uh, uh, that is a reference today in integer tutoring system and so we can see that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is two standard deviation ahead in terms of achievement scores it means that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is clearly more efficient than conventional teaching and so this is what ITS tried to model uh, some, some distinguishing features of intelligent tutoring systems according to Wolf are uh, interactive learning, student modeling, generativity, mixed initiative and so on. In this particular ITS we have five features of intelligent tutoring system. You can check out our paper for more information. So the road ahead is to get better rating for each letter meaning better accuracy at judging the quality of a user input a uh, second point is to provide better quality sample for each letter and finally to conduct a usability study as we have started with our our local school preschool partner that's all thank you for your attention and uh, feel free to ask any question if you want Nobody in the list is raising their hands yet, but feel free, we have time to answer questions about this uh, project and Antonis is eager to satisfy your curiosity, I'm sure.
Um, yes, maybe I can jump in with a question. Um, Antonius, uh, so uh, from a project, comparable project we did years ago, uh, one of the main requirements we had to satisfy was that children, little children, need to repeat a lot. Calligraphy is repetition. And, and, uh, and, and of course, they need uh, encouragement. And so how do you go about this? in this setup, are, is, is that included in your goals or is that an, an other requirement? No, actually it's, a, it's one, of the, uh, one of the main goals of this is that um, the uh, letters that are shown are usually, well, are, are always variations. They're not exactly the same, which means that there's a new challenge every time, at least the kinesthetic sense. Uh, that's something that the AI does. AI does, uh, so it uses a corpus of data, we've trained a model that produces letters that are slightly different or very different. One of the future work is to make sure that they're not too different because then it becomes like almost like a line. Um, the other thing that we do for repetition is also to kind of feed what uh, Jean-Michel mentioned, uh, the mixed initiative components to actually model the letter, a successful letter, a successful repetition, as you say, will be fed in into the next one. So when you sh show the next letter, it matches what the um, player did, but not exactly, because it's again in passing through the latent space. Um, so there's variation, which is important so to avoid boredom. And there's some sort of personalization because it matches a bit more what the uh, child is doing. Not too much, because we still try to match it to, against the right way to, uh, to write. So if you're steering, way too far from the right way to write, you go back to the automatically generated letter. So yes, repetition was exactly what we had in mind uh, for this to avoid um, rep blind repetition and not just tropes. So we have to do a variation. That's what we do. Right, thanks so much. Okay, I think that all things being the same, yes, nobody's raising hands further. We should move on to the last talk in this um, section. In this case, it's, well, it's another one from the island where we're on, from Malta. We have a 10 minute presentation titled, Analyzing Mob Mobile VR Games for Learning a Sport, Pistol Target Shooting VR Game Use Case. Uh, the speakers are, um, Marcel, Greg, and Owen Sacco, and they provided a video which is ready to run whenever you want to run. Hey guys, I would like to first of all thank you for joining me for the discussion about my paper. I am Marcel Greg, and this was part of my bachelor's degree dissertation, which I have done with the help of Dr. Owen Sacco. As you have guessed by the title, this research paper is on the VR technology and its benefits when used for practicing type shooting. Before starting, I have done tons of research on different areas of studies, but it was the potential of VR that inspired me to conduct this research. According to Rosansky, approximately 500 million VR headsets are set to be sold by the year 2025, and the global market size is expected to reach $120.5 billion by 2026. In my study, I have created a VR application that was based on the sports of target shooting. I have also built a virtual reality shooting range environment with which users could immerse themselves even further into the game. Me and Dr. Sacco decided that it would be best if there were three different game versions of the game, since from research we couldn't find any papers that studied the effects of time constraints on user performance. These three difficulty levels varied from the time constraints. One was a one minute version, another was the two minute version, and lastly, a three minute version. The main application was the two minute version. From this research, we wanted to find out if VR can help people into learning the sport of target shooting. We also wanted to know if people can improve their skill at this sport with this technology. And we also wanted to know if VR was as effective as a real-life shooting range for beginners. 
For data gathering, we conducted a general public survey from which four of six responses were gathered. This, this was done so that we could get a general idea of what people think about this technology, because if research worked and people weren't interested in using it, it would have been useless. We had also tested the application on professional target shooters, and they were asked a series of questions. This was done so that we could verify that the application was a good reflection of a shooting range. For the main testing, two groups of participants took part in the study. The control group, which did not use the VR and at all, and the experimental group, which used the VR. We took both groups to the shooting range pre-VR testing for the experimental group, and after using the VR application, they both returned to the real-life shooting range, where their performance was once again recorded. This ensured that pre-VR testing both groups were on the same level. Finally, we had the version testing for the application. After these sessions, participants that were using the VR were asked a series of questions regarding the game. For the results, we will start with the general public survey. From the general public survey, we have noticed that the majority of respondents who did not own any VR headsets were interested in buying one and were mostly interested in the PC platform. Majority of respondents who never used VR were interested in doing so in the future. As mentioned earlier, a group of professional target shooters used the game and were asked a series of questions. While professional athletes had a good experience with the game, and the majority stated that this was an effective way for individuals to start learning the sport. For the pre-testing, both the control team and the experimental team went to the real-life shooting range, and from the results that were gathered, they both had the same average performance pre-VR. After this, the experimental team continued to the next testing stage, where they were asked to test the three versions of the application a number of times. The best performance was when they used the three minute version and the worst was when they used the one minute version. They went on to test further the main application. From the results that were gathered, all participants bettered their performance gradually. This means that from the first to the seventh performance record, the points always increased. Post-intervention testing was done next. This is where both teams were united again into the shooting range and their performance was retested and recorded again. From this session, the experimental team that used the VR had a better performance than the control team, which meant that VR was in fact beneficial for people wanting to learn the sport. These participants were asked a few questions regarding both their VR experience and their experience at the shooting range. 40% of participants using the VR felt moderately more confident when returning to the shooting range. Another 40% stated that they felt slightly more confident, whereas the other 20% did not feel confident at all. Furthermore, although most participants enjoyed their testing at the real-life shooting range, they were unlikely to visit the range on a daily basis. The majority were very interested in using VR in other areas as well, and all participants agreed that this VR application was in fact helping them to develop better aiming. As a conclusion from this research, we have found that VR is an effective tool for learning or improving the skill of target shooting. It also improves the cognitive health of individuals as they continually improve their score. And yes, time constraints affect the player's performance. For future improvements, it would be interesting to implement more competitive features that could help individuals to practice for competition. It would also be more convenient to implement two versions in one, so that, so that the participants can choose which version they want to play. Thank you for your time. If you would like to ask any questions or a full version of the study, please do not hesitate to contact me on my email. All right, thank you for that. Um, 
I would have questions about the musical background, but instead I will ask one about a term that Owen, I suppose this is one of your students, used uh, yep. in the presentation. She yeah, talked right. about an improvement in cognitive health. Can you uh, clarify what that meant? So um, basically what she meant was that um, after recording the, um, so after using the VR um, a number of times, right? Um, it showed that actually the aiming of the participants improved over time. So um, we sort of assumed that with the VR use, like um, the more you use it, like the better you, you, you get um, eventually with it um, on that particular skill. In this case, it was, um, um, in this case, apart from the actual um, shooting itself, but the actual aiming. Um, so the aiming skill um, used through this game actually improved over time. I'm not sure that answers my question, but I think Antonius has uh, one himself. Uh, please unmute yourself and just ask. It's, a, it's very much a follow-up, actually, because um, I had a question on were they, were they using air guns or uh, real, uh, real firearms uh, in the shooting range? Yeah, so, so it was um, clay pigeon shooting range. Okay, because I was wondering whether it was only the aim that was improved because uh, the kinesthetic experience, but, the, the kickback was not something you get in VR, right? Sure, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So um, that actually... Um, they were asked about that, but it actually didn't, didn't affect that. So there wasn't any effect, even both at the range and even at the VR. So um, in fact, um, so pre before, before actually, um, so as, as the students mentioned that before we actually tested out with the control team and experimental team and professional athletes tried the game and they kind of didn't have anything to say about that. So um, they kind of like, it wasn't noticeable like kind of thing. And also, like when non-professionals, so to speak, actually tried both at the range and the VR, they didn't have anything to say about that. Yeah. So yeah. So so as a uh, sorry as a, as a, to to, to clarify uh, also to clarify, it's a pistol, right? So it's a um, normal pistol, so it's not a shotgun or anything of the sort. So it's a pistol, um, so to speak, and uh, yeah, and clay pigeon target range, yeah. Can you remind me of when the quantity of people who you actually use for both the main group and the control group? Sure, there were there were ten in each group, so there were ten for the control and ten for the experimental, okay. and then there were around seven to ten for the professional athletes too. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we have any further inquiries about your publication. I don't see anybody right now, unless somebody has a last minute question. It does not look that way. Okay, so with a few minutes to spare, like uh, uh, seven in total or six and a half, um, I thank you for your participation and thank you for your papers, everybody, both the authors and the participants. If you remain in room number two, we're going to have a game criticism and analysis session uh, chaired by Renata. It will start in, again, six minutes approximately, so you can stick around or you can move to room one, or you can dedicate yourself to your favorite hobby. And I'm out. Uh, this is the last one for me today. Ciao. Thank you.